So I begin this evening's welcome and reflection just by articulating what I think we all know and that is I believe that we're all very fortunate to be here and uh, obviously a good number of people will be feeling a little bit tired people have been travelling from various places we've got three Australians just arrived not long ago we have a man from Singapore, is he here yet? Okay, our guest from Singapore, welcome. And uh, three people arrived from Thailand yesterday. But just considering this facility, this particular facility, Brothers Bungalow on Penang Hill, was offered by, actually by Ajahn Sri Panyo's father, who's a fairly wealthy business person in Malaysia. And uh, he wanted to make it available for retreats. So his company, or his charity, uh, paid for the renovation. It used to be a Christian Brothers Seminary. So that's really wonderful. Then, of course, whenever you have a retreat, you have people who've been putting a lot of work into coordinating the retreat behind the scenes. So you turn up to a facility like this, and it's already fairly clean, and the mats are in place, and there's a shrine, and the food is already being prepared. So we all know this, but it's just nice to rejoice and uh, understand that among human beings to be able to have the time to come and spend it'll be eight full days particularly reflecting inwardly and putting down the more worldly duties that uh, we usually have to attend to that's a really precious opportunity that most human beings don't have so thank you to Mr. Krishnan for uh, making the facility available. This is actually my first time here today. Just arrived, but I've seen photos and spoke to other people who've uh, practiced here. And I think it's uh, very suitable. There's this lovely sense of being above everything. And uh, it's quiet. And the afternoons can be a little bit warm, but in general it's very cool compared to the rest of Malaysia. It's very cool weather. The other thing I like is this particular hall we're all sitting in, it feels very solid. I don't know if you've seen how they made the, these buildings, I'm not quite sure how old it is, but uh, it was well made. These great big granite slabs to make the walls. And you can feel that, you can feel this kind of solidity. And so, for myself, uh, for meditation practice, it's really wonderful when there's a nice sense of something solid underneath. You can, you feel like you're not going to fall through the floor. You can relax. Then also there's a lovely sense of space above you as well. So it's a, a nice place to get grounded and then also to allow the mind to become more expansive, more spacious. I think you're all informed. We were originally charged a nominal fee for the accommodation and we were informed later that that fee is also being waived. So your accommodation here is a gift from uh, Mr. Krishnan's charity. So you've been charged for food and for laundry and you get to use this facility. So this is a result I believe of past good karmas that you've all produced that you can uh, have access to this and uh, I think we're going to be deepening on those good, good past deeds. We'll be making more, performing more good deeds. In terms of good deeds, the Buddha praises the mental cultivation as being that which produces the most merit. It's the most auspicious, uh, karmically auspicious activity that we can do. So, in a way I'm just kind of making these positive affirmations here because uh, we're all a bit scattered and we've all been a bit busy, so it's like, in a way, recognizing, wow, this is a good opportunity this brightens the mind, doesn't it? Because one gift that human beings have, and uh, me too sometimes, is we all have a gift for feeling sorry for ourselves. Because, because of this noble truth of suffering, you know, that affects all of us, there are challenges in all of our lives. There is dukkha that impinges on our minds in various ways. That's the experience of human beings. But among human beings, there's dukkha and then there's dukkha isn't there. And there's very few people that can take time out of their lives and uh, come and turn inwards. 
and learn about how the mind actually works. One metaphor which is interesting is if you can imagine like a, a slide projector, an old-fashioned movie projector projecting onto a screen. And so most of the time we're caught in the images, caught in the story, looking outside and, and then reacting, reacting to the picture. And uh, what we're doing when we're coming to these kind of retreats is that we can actually have a look at the, what's projecting, not just looking at the picture. When you close your eyes and you come inwards and you arrest your awareness in that heart area and you notice thoughts come out of that space, when you start to get a bit more sensitive, get a bit more samadhi, more mindfulness, you actually can notice there's energy in the mind and out of that energy is these thoughts coming and various sense impressions affect us and that affects the mind and there's feelings, mental feelings. And then there's associated memories with certain perceptions, sounds, sights, the words that remind us of things and then thoughts start turning around the mind and most of the time we're completely caught in the movie. And so what we're doing is that we're coming back and having a look at inside, the Dhamma leading inwards and leading onwards. So we're taking this time to practice to go inwards and have a look how does it work really? With regards to the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering, it's a really wonderful opportunity to see in these meditation retreats what is the cause of suffering really? Because uh, I was just saying how we are very good at feeling sorry for ourselves and we can forget the suffering is real, it's valid in a certain context, but we often forget how fortunate we are. And when we realize how fortunate we are, that sense of self-pity evaporates and that's always a relief because recognizing good fortune and, and rejoicing in good fortune, that's pleasant mind state. But lamenting and getting stuck in, in uh, what we think is wrong and what we think isn't good enough, that's oppressive. So recognizing our good fortune is, is a good beginning. And then the other thing about feeling sorry for ourselves is we're very good at blaming things for the suffering. So it can be the weather, it can be the government, it can be the neighbor, it can be the dog, it can be the computer not working like it's supposed to, any number of things, you can say, uh, causing me to have a bad mood. We come and meditate, we can see that actually the cause of our suffering is our own liking and disliking and reacting to feelings, pleasant mental feelings. So you like something, you have a pleasant mental feeling. You don't like something, you have an unpleasant mental feeling. And then we have a, a reaction to that feeling. So this is, uh, you only really see these deeper truths when you come and meditate. People who meditate a lot might catch it more quickly, but for busy lay people, it's these meditation retreats and these day-long retreats, these kind of things where we can really have a, a really good look. What is suffering really? And what is the cause of suffering really? And then the wonderful news and the incredible good fortune here is that we can begin to ask ourselves, is it possible to let go of suffering? Is it possible not to suffer? And so Lord Buddha says it is. And the Arahants say it is. It's possible not to suffer. There is that which is beyond Dukkha. And so in our uh, coming retreat, we have a really good opportunity to investigate this. If suffering arises, where is it really? We have a good look and we try to kind of break it down into sometimes called the five khandhas. We look at it where it is in the body. It's often in the heart area. And then what is it actually? It's a feeling. You have physical feelings and you have mental feelings. And we have a good look at feelings and then the thoughts. I and mean, as we generate more and more mindfulness, we begin to see a thought as a thought, a feeling as a feeling, a body as just a body, and suffering as actually being something that we do, not something that other things make us experience. Suffering is actually something that we're doing. And uh, we're doing it because we believe we're a self. And this is fair enough. This is uh, what everyone else is doing as well, except for a small few of realized masters. Basically, this habitual, deluded assumption that we are a self is, uh, is very pervasive, it's very deep.
we've been doing it for apparently, according to the Buddha, we've been doing it for millions of lifetimes. So that's a very deep habit. But what Lord Buddha is telling us, and what the Arahants are telling us, thank goodness they're telling us as well, is that actually it's something we're doing and we have the potential not to do it and we have the capacity to learn how not to do it and so this is where this uh, phrase that often comes up in Ajahn Chah's teachings one of the most important aspects to our practice is learning how to let go because uh, your mindfulness gets a bit better, we'll be doing sitting and walking, sitting and walking and you'll get more clearly aware of your breath, more clearly aware of your footsteps a little bit more space from your thoughts, seeing a thought as a thought and there'll be times when you'll see that sometimes suffering is oppressive and you're kind of stuck with it and you respond with metta and you respond with patience which is skillful but you'll also see that sometimes you can just put it down you can just recognize oh, an unskillful reaction and responding to pain with aversion or responding to a craving with a more craving and you'll see that you're doing that and you'll be able to just don't do that come back, rest with the breath, one in breath, one out breath or rest with the awareness of the space around the breath and between the in breath and between the out breath so that's our very good opportunity this uh, next week or so learning about suffering as a noble truth. So the Buddha called it a noble truth. That's very interesting. And then of course you've got the noble truth of the cause and the noble truth of the cessation and the noble truth of the path leading to complete cessation of suffering. So I think we will do a puja but I want us just to because this is going to be mostly about meditation I want us just to do our first session of meditation now and I'll just give a little bit of guided instruction just to kind of set that tone of uh, sitting, turning inwards, having a look at uh, how things are. One last thing I'll say though, before I forget, just about the mobile phones. We are on top of a mountain, we've been given the opportunity to practice in a meditation center, we haven't even had to pay. People have offered their time to set it up for us. So in terms of auspicious karma that's ripening in your life now to give you a very good opportunity to meditate, it doesn't get much better. You're very, very lucky. And the advent of this new technology means that we can be on top of the mountain without being on top of the mountain, unfortunately. So I want to encourage you to really be on top of the mountain and to really be here and not to send your mind back to the suburbs that you came from. So, with regards to the mobile phone, if you don't need to look at it, please don't even look at it. If you really don't need to. If you get a message, and it seems really important, if you can avoid making a call, send a simple text message. I'll talk to you about this in six days. Whatever, just keep it really simple. And be aware of how you affect others, because others are turning inwards, others are trying to be restrained, but if they see those around them answering their WhatsApp and line, it will be agitating to others. So as a gift to yourself and as a gift to everyone else, put it away. So one thing we often do in our lives is we tend to choose the time that we'll meditate. And we'll tend to choose a time when we're not feeling too tired or when we're not too busy and often if we have been busy and we are tired we'll have a nap of course this is fair enough it's also interesting in terms of really sincere practitioners those who want to be liberated from all suffering those that want to understand the ultimate truth there's a different way a different approach or a different attitude where basically you meditate at many times of the day or night and get familiar with meditating with the mind as it is. And Ajahn Chah, I say often, Ajahn Chah says, when you're peaceful, you meditate. This is the instruction he gave his disciples. When you're peaceful, you meditate. When you're not peaceful, you meditate. When you feel like meditating, you meditate. When you don't feel like meditating, you meditate. And uh, that's the, the advice of the enlightened sage that knows what it takes to become enlightened. But one thing that can make our meditation much easier is 
not expecting the mind to be a pleasant space to experience and not expecting it to be peaceful. So as those who are interested in Dhamma practice, those who are interested in truth, we can try to develop this attitude of coming to our sitting cushion and just having a look at it, whatever it is, and just being okay with it, whatever it is. So for tonight, many people have been traveling, some people have been busy setting up the retreat, other people are in a new place for the first time, so there might be some confusion, there might be some fatigue, and that's fine. So it's just kind of closing the eyes and sitting straight and just having a look, what's it like? And without wishing it was otherwise and without, without having aversion to it. So just opening the heart with a, a spacious sense of interest. We're just being interested in how it is and also with an attitude of accepting it, just allowing it as it is and then just paying attention. We want to be paying attention to the mind a lot. Just pay attention, just notice, just notice. What's it like now? What's it like now? It's like this. Ajahn Sumedho is often saying, it's like this. Just notice, it's like this. And so, using the breath awareness as the, the object, we're not going to try to have a refined breath awareness at this stage. Just take a few deep breaths, I would suggest. Nose, chest, abdomen, abdomen, chest, nose. Trying to breathe in some fresh energy, just breathing in the breath energy, allowing the breath to come in, kind of arriving, okay, really arriving. And breathing out, just putting down the feelings of tiredness, fatigue, breathing them out to the extent that you can. Breathing in, arriving, breathing out, relaxing, and at the same time paying attention moment to moment and gently waking up. Just waking up a little to the moment. And just try to bring a kind of a tender awareness to the heart area. This is what it feels like when it's tired. This is what it feels like when it's dull. This is what it feels like when it's worried. Or this is what it feels like when it's not sure. And just allowing it to be like that and breathing in. And breathing out, relaxing. And in a way, not expecting the mind to become peaceful on this first meditation session, just beginning. Beginning a process of being interested in your mind, paying a closer attention, reining things inwards. And often in life, we're trying to run away. We feel tired, we run off and have a nap. We feel restless, we act it out. Meditation practitioners, we have to be able to just be with these things in a non-contending way. And learn, just learn from the mind. Okay, this is what it's like when it feels a bit tired. This is what it's like when there's dullness, sleepiness, or this is what it's like when there's lots of thinking. Ajahn Chah gives an analogy, very helpful, about when you first come to the meditation session. For those of you who visited Northeast Thailand, many people have chickens and they have a kind of a coop, which is like a dome that they place on top of the chicken. They don't want the dogs to get it and they don't want the chicken to run away. So they place this fairly big dome over the chicken and the chicken runs around, pecks at the ground quite a bit. It's 
sits for a bit, gets up for a bit, sits for a bit, but eventually the chicken comes and sits when it realizes it's kind of stuck. And so you allow the mind, you have this kind of parameter trying to be aware of the entire in-breath and the entire out-breath, but this thought will take it away, come back. The thought will take it away, come back. Doze off for a few seconds, come back. And it's a bit like that chicken, it's running away, it's not settling. But you allow it to do that within certain parameters. And then what you'll find is if you just keep paying attention, and with the in-breath, keep waking up a little, with the out-breath, putting down tensions, resistance, aversion, just allowing it to be as it is. You find that the mind responds to the kindness and the gentleness and the patience. The mind responds to these qualities that you bring to your meditation and it settles. Sometimes it settles just a little, not particularly deeply. Sometimes it settles very deeply. And so we just guide it gently, putting that cover over the chicken, just keeping it within parameters. Aware of the in-breath, aware of the out-breath. So usually we're teaching that we use buddho, a way of utilizing the thinking mind to help it to be with the meditation object. A very beautiful word, rich with profound meaning, which is totally to do with the path of practice. The Buddha was awakened, awakened from delusion, awakened from ignorance, awakened to the ultimate truth, and in becoming awakened, liberated from every type of suffering. So that's really wonderful, amazing. We can also understand Buddha, Buddha, as meaning mindfully aware and awake to the extent that we can be. And so aware of the breath to the extent that we can be, breathing in, Bud. If there is quite a bit of thinking, breathing in Buddha, breathing out Buddha. If there's not so much thinking, you can make it a bit more spacious. Breathing in, put. Breathing out, do. You don't have to try to pretend to be the Buddha. We're undergoing a process which necessitates being truthful now. You know, truthfulness is a very important factor in what enables us to realize the truth. So we don't pretend to be enlightened. We aspire to be, but you bring this quality of knowing awareness to the state of your mind, however it is. And in doing that, qualities like clarity and stillness will develop. And we use the breath, breathing in, butto, breathing out, butto, breathing in, waking up, breathing out, whatever hindrances there are, trying to put them down. If you can't put them down, just trying to loosen the grip on them, the mind's grip on them, put some space around them, don't believe them. Breathing in, Buddha, awake, aware, gently awake, gently aware. Breathing out, Buddha, whatever thoughts there are, not believing them, so observing a thought as a thought. 
we're aware of the content. A thought about the past is a thought about the past, a thought about the future is a thought about the future, a thought about other people is a thought about other people, but it's all just thought. Breathing in, putto. Breathing out, putto. It'll be a fairly short session. I just encourage you to sit for another 15 minutes. Training this awareness turning inwards, learning how to identify the breath, recognize the breath, hold the feeling of the breath in awareness and hopefully resting in the awareness of the breath as the mind begins to settle down in the next few days. Give it some time, don't expect too much, at the same time I think you can all feel very optimistic. We'll be doing lots of sitting, lots of walking. Most likely your mindfulness will get quite a bit clearer. And you'll experience some peace. But just enjoying the process and allowing it to be as it is. Aware of one in-breath. Butto, aware of one out breath, butto.